So um, the last time we talked, basically the statement that Jesus ends up saying is, I and the Father are one. He says, at the time of the Feast of Dedication, it took place at Jerusalem. It was winter. Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. The Jews gathered around him, said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And basically he says, you know what, guys, for three years, I've been very plain in telling you who I am, but you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. That's a hard thing to hear. The reason you don't believe is because you are not the elect. That's tough. But look, I didn't say it. Jesus said, but you do not believe me because you are not part of my flock. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. You are not part of my flock. My sheep hear my voice, and they know me, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, now get this. Now listen to this verse, everyone. Let me see your eyes look at me when I say this. My Father who has given them to me. So if you're a part of Jesus's flock, it's because God has given you to him. So if you have a problem with election, you have a problem with God, not me. What verse is that? That is verse 29. Thank you. My father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. And here's what he ends up saying. I and the father are one. Now, if you go back to Genesis 1, what does it say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. Now get this. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And then just a few verses later, I'm sorry, chapter two, it says, hold on, let me make sure. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, just a few verses later in verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image. Now, John, John, in John 1, clarifies this and says, again, just like Genesis, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything that was made that was made. So in Genesis 1, we see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in creation. And all through John, we see this message, I and the Father are one. Jesus is telling the Pharisees, I created the universe and I created you. And again, he says in verse 30, I and the Father are one. Which is interesting. So let's 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 
backtrack a little bit because this is an interesting postulation. Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. But then he says, I and the father are one. So those who are elect are not just get, chosen by God and given to Jesus. They're chosen by the Trinity given to Jesus and secured by the Holy Spirit. Let, just let that bubble in your mind for a second. So there is a complete unity in the election of believers. How God does this, I don't know. Who God elects, I don't know. But it's there. Any questions about that before we move on? Because if there's questions about that, I want to entertain them now, I think, so that we can have some kind of... I'm trying to understand the significance yeah. of it not being God the Father, but being all three in the Trinity who does the election. I think the significance is the unity of God, the oneness of God, that, that the Father and the Son are so incorporated, and the Spirit are so incorporated, having the same will. It's not like the Father said, I'm going to choose him, and Jesus said, oh, really? And the Spirit said, oh, okay, I guess. Right. There, Tony? there's, yes, Robert. Uh, <clears throat> I've heard people argue from <clears throat> First John two, one to two, where especially in verse two it says, "He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, not for our, not and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world." So what, how do we defend against that? Well, it's not a matter of defense, it's a matter of explanation. Explain, uh -huh. Right, when, remember that John is talking about, for instance, if I was saying to this group here, hey, Jesus is the propitiation for our sin, but not mm -hmm. only for our sin, but for the church universal. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The sins of the whole world means every elect in the entire world encompassed in time. Mm -hmm. He's talking to a certain audience. So he's saying, this doesn't just apply to you, but it applies to every believer who's ever been elected by God. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. So the the whole yeah. world, the word is cosmos, right? Cosmos, trend in Greek means yeah, because mm -hmm. because we're talking about the church universal. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing, Robert. If Jesus died for every sinner in the entire universe, then every sinner would be saved. Mm -hmm. because he paid for their sins, <clears throat> period. Whether, the, whether you recognize it or not, he paid for your sins. So if Jesus was the propitiation, that's a very specific word, for every person in the entire world who ever lived, then everyone is going to heaven, including Hitler and, and the devil, you know. <laughs> So, you have two choices. The two choices are one, that, that when John is saying that, and remember, 
Robert, remember that first John and the Gospel of John went out together. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they would be one would explain the other would explain the other. So one, either Jesus died for everyone and no one's going to hell, which in that case, look, let's just call it a day. <laughs> let's close up the computer. Let's live however we want, because in the end, we're all going to heaven, which Rob Bell would preach and, and <laughs> probably Olstein and some of the others. Right. So that's, that's one choice. The other choice is it's talking about something else. Well, John is writing the letter to a specific audience. So when he says not only you or not only us, he's talking to a group of people, like I'm talking to this group of people, not only us, but every other elected believer. Those are the only two interpretations you have of that. So either, either it's universalism and the gospel doesn't matter, because everyone's saved anyway, you might as well do live however you want, or the gospel does matter. Does that make sense, Robert? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I that, got that's, that from, from that's how you combat that because when people talk like that, oh look, it says every, they're not, they're taking it out of the context that John is writing to a specific group of people. So mm -hmm. You have to read it. You know, if I wrote a letter to Pat and you took that letter and said, oh, it's it applies to everyone, people would say you're crazy mm -hmm. because the letter is addressed to Pat. So it doesn't apply to everyone. It applies to Pat. Sorry, Pat, you're always my go-to example. Yeah, I heard that on the radio yesterday or when I was driving and listening to uh, Jay Vern Vernon McGee, and they wanted the listener post posted that question. I, I don't remember how he answered that, but you know, I just well, I just remember that verse. Oh, I, I knowing Jay that. Vernon, knowing Jay Vernon, he probably answered it like I did. Because uh -huh. he wasn't a universalist. Right. Tony? Uh, it's, uh, yes. Chris here. Uh, it might not be, I, I might not be in sync with the letter, uh, the letter that John wrote, but what confuses me a little bit is I thought that Jesus died for all of our sins and that he reached out and if we don't, if we don't grab onto him and say, okay, I accept your offer, your invitation, uh, that, uh, that's, that's kind of like, and, and I don't have any foundation, biblical foundation, but it just, I, I, I have a hard time. I struggle with understanding the, the elect where it's like, when I hear that, okay, he's, he died for all of our sins. But if we don't, if we don't reach out and say, I want, I want you, I, you know, I want, I want to be saved by you. If we don't reach out, it takes a, and that's the, that's the freedom and the liberty that we have. I thought is we could be a sinner and we can reject him or accept his offer. No, you can't. As a sinner, you're dead. Your will is dead. You're enslaved to sin. You, you're, the Bible says in Romans and in Ephesians, you're spiritually dead. So how can a spiritually dead person reach out? You can't. Well, you before can't. you become, but before you become a believer, like it, before I became born again, essentially what you're saying is I was dead because I was not born again. I didn't accept Christ. No, no, Am no. I mistaken? You're, 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 you're being born again was not your choice. It was an act of God's will on you. If, uh, if you're a dead person, right, let's say you're dead, which the Bible says you are spiritually dead. Right. Right. And I, let's say you're a dead body and I have the elixir of life. And I'm standing above you, and I say, Chris, just take this, drink this, and you'll live. Are you going to take it and drink it? I struggle you can't. with that. I, no, I you can't. That. You're no, dead. You can't because you're dead, but I struggle with the analogy because I was born of my mother, 
and I'm a human being. And what you're saying then is I have absolutely no freedom of thought, freedom of uh, freedom. No, to no, do, no. Or freedom you, of your freedom of will is limited in the slavery of sin. Huh. Okay. You have no ability to love, honor, or believe, or repent unless God gives it to you. You're dead in your trespasses and your sin. You're unable. You're unable in any way to make a movement towards God. Think of it this way, Chris. There's a reason why God in Genesis recorded how he created man. He created man in his image. But remember that he created him out of the dirt of the ground. But what did God have to do in order for man to live? Die. He had to breathe. No, no, no. God had to breathe yeah. life into yeah, the earth. God, yeah. uh, yes. God had to breathe life breathe. into him. Yeah. So when Nicodemus came to Jesus in John chapter 3, Jesus said this, unless someone is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born again when he is old? Exactly. You can't. It's impossible for you. That's Christ's point. It's impossible for you to be born. Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? Absolutely not. You can't. You're, you had, Chris, did you have any choice to be conceived? No. Did you have any choice to travel through your mother's birth canal and enter into this world? No. Then, then why do you think God created birth to resemble that? He created it to show you what, how election works. And in John 3, Jesus explains it. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, that's born in the mother's womb, in the water sack, and born of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You were born of your mother and you had no choice. You also have no choice in that you were being born again. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Now listen to what he says. Do not marvel that I said you must be born again. The wind, the pneuma in Greek, blows where it wishes. In other words, the pneuma or wind blows where it desires. You have no control over it. You hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is everyone who is born of the spirit. Now, here's the interesting thing. The Greek word for wind is pneuma, and the Greek word for spirit is pneuma. Mm -hmm. Jesus says... The pneuma blows, and you have no control over it. So it is with those who are born of the pneuma. They have no control over it. Chris, are okay. you a believer? Yes. God overwhelmed your will. He breathed his life into you. He created you again, born again, against your will. You wanted to go to hell you wanted to be a sinner. You wanted to go your own way in rebellion to God. God overcame your will. He granted you faith. He granted you repentance. He pulled you, as Jesus said, no man can come to the Father unless the Father, or I'm sorry, no man can come to the Son unless the Father pulls him or brings him. It's the same Greek word that you wrap a rope around a goat or donkey neck and pull it into the stable against his will. Chris, you wanted to go to hell. You were bound for hell and God wrapped a rope of love around your neck 
and pulled you into new birth, granting you faith and granting you repentance. And you should be on your knees every day thanking God that you are saved and it had nothing to do with you. And everything to do with his love for you. Now okay. that should empower your life. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Because yeah, what uh, does Paul say? N neither breath, neither life, nor death, nor principalities, nor powers, nor anything, anything can separate us from the love of God. Paul was so strong on the unseparative love of God because he understood election. Mm -hmm. so this this is so huge and the problem is and i'm going to just be honest with you guys so many churches are teaching wrong false theology why do you think our country and the church is in the state it is in it's yeah. because they have neglected to teach the sovereign saving power of Christ. And Christ did not die for every person in the universe. He died for the elect. If Jesus paid the price for every person in the universe, <clears throat> then every person would go to heaven. Period. Chris, if I went to your 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 banker and paid your mortgage and paid your visa and paid your electric bill and paid off all of your cars it wouldn't matter whether you believed i did it or not it would be paid off and you would never receive another bill from any of those people it has nothing to do with the fact that you believe it has the fact that what jesus has done mm -hmm. right. so if you're a universalist Faith doesn't matter. Jesus has paid your sin, and faith means nothing at all. If you understand that Christ died only for the elect, then faith and grace is the key to identify those who have been born again. Okay, that I it's 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 getting more clear. <laughs> Okay, it, you yeah. know, Chris, it's okay. It's, just hard, it's hard to wrap my head around uh, around that. I and I don't believe that it's just like he died for everybody and everybody's going to heaven. It's just like I struggle with the the, the difference between the free will. If we have, it, it's almost like if my my thoughts are is we don't have free will then. No, you don't. No. Your will is not free until you're saved, Chris. You now have for the first time in your life. You wake up each morning making a decision whether or not to serve God or serve sin. Before That's free will. Before that, you could only serve sin, right? Isn't that biblical? Isn't that what the Bible says? I'm going to say yes. Yes, it is. So free will is a factual thing, but you don't have free will until you're saved. When you're not saved, you're enslaved to sin. There is no free will. Um, Tony. Yes. Okay, but you you just said a little bit earlier that your free will is limited. I mean, which that kind of made more sense to me in a sense that. Well, I mean, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is that if you want to look at freedom, you're only free within the boundaries of your enslavement to sin, and even that depends on the grace of God. Right. So no. You don't have free will, if that helps you. You're enslaved, period. Well, if I was talking to somebody, okay, I get that. You know, I get the enslavement to sin because there's no way we can get out of it, right? We're all going to, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I get that. Um, But if I, you know, I'm if I'm talking to somebody about this, they might say something like that. Well, of course you have free will. I can turn the television on. I can <laughs> turn the computer on. Right. And that's okay. So I want to let's save that for question and answer time because I want to okay. move okay. along in our passage. No. I want to keep going. Um, so let me get back to where I was here. Okay, I'll save that. Um 
John 10. Here we go. Okay. So Jesus makes this comment, I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. So they understand what he's saying. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from, from my Father. In other words, the works that I've done can only be done through the authority of Yahweh. So why, are you gonna, why do you want to kill me? Because if you're going to kill me, you're going to have to kill me because I'm proving that Yahweh and I are one. You can't just kill me because you're mad at what I'm saying. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, it's not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for the blasphemy, because you being man, make yourself God. See, they understood. Now, okay. Did, okay. Everyone look at me. Everyone look at me. I want to see your eyeballs. Didn't the Jews just ask Jesus to tell them plainly who he was? So he does. What's the response? They want to kill him. We're not killing you because of a good work. We're killing you because you make yourself equal with God. So do you think that Jesus was being very clear with them who he was? I think so. I think he was being very clear with who he was. Jesus answered them, is it not written in the law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent to the world, you are blaspheming because you said I am the Son of God? So in other words, God calls those who receive the word of God sons of God and therefore, I who bring the word of God and have been consecrated to be the messenger of God, I make myself equal to God, and you find that a hard problem? Why is that a hard problem for you? The word says that the Messiah will come, and I, Isaiah said, his name will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And I am telling you, I'm God with you. So if the scripture came to those who were called the sons of God, who said, Emmanuel, God will be with you, and now I'm here with you, why are you having a problem with that? I don't understand. Well, I do, but. If I am not doing the works of my father, then don't believe in me. Look, if my character is inconsistent, and by the way, if you're a Christian and your character is inconsistent with the works and, and, and character of Christ, then no one should believe you, that you're a Christian. So don't get mad when people say, I don't. You know, I think maybe you're not a Christian. It be, and why? Well, because I'm looking at your life and it doesn't mirror the attitude or the works of Christ. Don't fool yourself. If your life does not, if your life is not following the thoughts and actions of Christ, then you're not a believer. Don't lie to yourself. A lot of people lie to themselves. But if I do them, if I do the works of God, even though you do not believe me, believe that another way I look at you, if you don't even like me, then, then you've got to admit that I'm fulfilling prophecy, that what I'm doing is theologically, supernaturally, um, unquestionably the work of God. So, you know, okay, you don't like me, but you got a skill. Your own theology tells you I'm, I am son of God. Again, they sought to arrest him, 
but he escaped their hands. <laughs> like he just walks away, you know, whatever. And she, you know what? It shows the complete control that Christ had over the whole situation. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. I think it's very interesting that Christ goes back to the beginning of his ministry. And I think it's interesting that people find him there. And it, it is interesting because John was the last Old Testament prophet. John never did a miracle. John did not do one supernatural thing. What did he do? What did he do? He simply proclaimed Jesus Christ. Now, for my charismatic friends, let me tell you, you don't have to do a miracle. Just proclaim Christ. God never asks us to go do a miracle. The most effective prophet, the greatest prophet that ever lived, John the Baptist, that's out of the words of Jesus' mouth, never did a miracle. What made him so great? He proclaimed. Here is the Lamb of God. He proclaimed the gospel. You want to be a great Christian, you don't have to go heal someone with cancer or do a miracle. Just proclaim the salvation of Jesus Christ. 